A lot of you like to create content and share it with others. I certainly do. Now, there's a lot more to content creation than just creating the content itself. How do you get an audience? What topics do you create your content for? Which social networks do you focus on? How do you deal with the algorithms that we often seem to be on the opposing side of? To learn all about this and more, I talked to content creator extraordinaire Dillian Megida, who I've been following for several years. It's going to be a really fun chat that walks through his journey, how he got started, and how he keeps the motivation to create all the great developer content that he puts out on a regular basis. Hope you enjoy it. All right. Hi, Dillian. How's it going? Hi, Kirupa. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, by the way. Yeah, you're pronouncing it perfectly. Okay, awesome. Yeah, it's going... It's going fine. It's going um, great. I yeah, had so, my first day today at the office, so that was nice. Oh, congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. And so what do you do? I am um, at, at the office. So like my full-time job is developer advocacy. And okay. besides my full-time job, I'm also a content creator, creating different forms of content from articles to videos to Instagram posts. And I mean, as many forms of content as I can lay my hands on. So would you consider yourself more of a developer? Uh, yes. I mean, I still write code. I still build stuff, building demo. So I think I, yeah, I mean, developer, being a developer is the foundation of the content that I create because most of them are still around code. So I think I can call myself a developer, yes. Okay. The reason I like to ask is that whenever I meet people who, you know, are developers, I like to ask, like, what is the first program you've ever written? Um, I think this was in school. Um, I think I first wrote Java. Yeah, I think that's the first language. I mean, not like we built anything, but I think the first programming language that was introduced to us was Java. Then before we went to Visual Basic and Dreamweaver and started doing HTML stuff. I, I hope I'm correct. I really can't remember perfectly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's always fun though because our, our memories often have this like weird way of like arranging, rearranging things sometimes. But Java is what I always hear about from many people as well. Like even for me, Java was the first language I learned at school. It's like hello world, really basic things. And then Public, yeah, same transition, main void, something like that. <laughs> oh, that's right, it's main void in Java. That's right. And then same transition, Visual Basic after that because as it turns out. You know, you can only do so many things in the console in Java before going really deep into like, you know, UI languages and yeah. Visual Basic was a natural position. So cool. That's a, that's a consistent story that I've seen from personally, as well as from others as well. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about content creation because I've been following you for quite some time on, on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube, and just kind of, I also work with you quite a bit on like articles and so on. And so from that point of view, how do you get started with content creation? Like that's what took you from, I'm doing programming, I'm learning things to, I want to create content. I, the first form of content I created was an article. So I actually started with writing articles and um, this was in 2019. So I was introduced to HTML in 2017, but from 2017 up until 2019, it was just more of watching tutorials. I wasn't really building anything. But it was from 2019 that I decided to take my tech journey serious, do more practicing, do more learning. And then I also realized because now I was trying to do more than just watching videos. I also wanted to read articles. I personally prefer videos, but I think in that moment, I also wanted to explore learning through articles. And I was reading a couple of articles and there was this one person who would usually or regularly post articles. And it got to a point where I was looking forward to what he writes next. And this was also with other people who were writing articles. And I think after some point, I just felt like if I'm learning from other people, I think other people can also learn from me. I can write something that somebody somewhere would possibly look forward to and just learn from. So I think that was just the desire. And I just felt like, okay, you know what? I'm going to put out my first article today. Where do I start from? And I was already reading articles on Dev too. So I felt like, oh, I already have a profile on Dev2, so I can start writing there. And that was why I pushed my first article. And I think there also I felt so enthusiastic and, yeah, just there was just so much juice in me that wanted me to just, okay, whenever I learn something, I want to write about it. Whenever I learn something, I want to write about it. After some point, I felt like, okay, I wanted to have my own personal website where people know that this is my website. They can find my articles there. And I think doing 
technical writing up until 2021. And I realized that, I mean, for somebody like me, I prefer videos to articles. If I find a video version of a topic, I would prefer um, using that to learn than reading an article. So I felt like, you know, people prefer video versions of stuff. So I felt, okay, I could also add this, this form of content to my technical writing. And that was where I started um, video creation. Started with uh, just my laptop and a very small ring light. But I mean, I'm glad to see how far I've become with, I've come with gadgets and all that. And uh, yeah, I was doing YouTube up until this year. And then this year I was like, okay, Instagram is another platform I can maximize to create content in form of um, pictures. I mean, I was on Instagram. I saw that people doing it. I saw like, oh, you can also grow because I also didn't expect that you can do something like that on Instagram. I thought Instagram is just more of like lifestyle, nature, and just all these beautiful images. So I saw some people doing it there. And I think one thing with me is I love maximizing as much platforms as I can lay my hands on to create my content. So when I saw that Instagram could be a platform for that, I jumped on there. When I saw that TikTok could also be a space for that, I jumped on there. So for me, I just like maximizing spaces where I could teach what I know because I believe there would be one or two people out there who would love to hear what I have to share. So that's just how my journey has been so far. There's a lot. I want to dive deeper into all these areas. But before I get all the way there, you mentioned you like to teach. Is it partly motivated just to share knowledge? Or do you also find that by teaching, you learn the material, you retain the material much better as well? Because a lot of content creators I run into often have the other side. They're like, I do enjoy the teaching part of it, interacting with new learners, but I also manage to retain the material so much mm-hmm. better, which just helps me be more effective. Well, for me, when I started, I started with just, I wanted to teach. I wanted to share what I already knew. But um, as time went by, I realized that even the things that I thought, I was having better understanding of them. Because for some of these things, I want to make some research. I don't just want to teach something false. So I also want to make some research to validate what I already know. And in the process of making research, I learned new things that I didn't even know before that even gives what the, the content I want to create gives it more context. So with time, I also realized that I learned even better by teaching. I mean, there are some topics where if I want to understand something in React, for example, and maybe I feel so lazy about learning it, all I just need to tell myself is, okay, I want to write an article about this. And then that would kind of inspire me to then learn about it, watch videos, read articles. So with time, I realized that it also improves my knowledge on things and i think that's the that's the second the first reason is of course to share then the second big reason is i also learn more effectively by teaching yeah no that that makes a lot of sense because oftentimes you're teaching in the back of your mind you're like okay why did i just write this you know what would someone who's reading it have a question on they might ask what are the other ways of doing this and so it almost gets to the point where you're like second guessing yourself and as part of answering your second guessings learning along the way. I often liken it to code reviews that our developers go through as part of any formal jobs or projects where they have to justify why they made a decision the way they did. Yeah. This to me is like a much lower pressure, more fun way of doing exactly this kind of an activity. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Nice. And so as part of writing as you're learning, it seems like some of the content is things you're writing about as you're learning it. And some of it is things you have a, like a, much deeper knowledge about they're simplifying for an audience how do you pick and choose which one you tend to write about on that on a particular time well um just like you said sometimes it's something i just learned recently maybe i just fix a bug or um just a new fancy tech or new fancy topic i get the better idea of I also get my ideas when people ask questions. Some some people would be like, oh, can you explain this in JavaScript? Can you explain this? Then I already have that idea. I, I put my ideas on a Notion page, so I have a, a bunch of them there. Some ideas I also have, uh, let's say I have an article version of a topic, and then I feel like, oh, I could also do a video version to complement um, this for readers who may prefer this mode. So. I don't have a specific way of selecting these things. I just go through my notion, the notion page I have. And I just, I think whatever excites me the most, that's how I make my selection sometimes. Whatever excites me the most. And I'm like, 
oh, this, this would be nice to have a video version of, or this would be nice to have an article version of, or an Instagram version of. Some other times is when people ask questions. So, you know, they say they are trying to learn this and that, and then they ask a particular question. So that also helps me to pick the topic for that moment because I already have a guarantee that somebody is going to need this immediately. At least one person is going to need this immediately. With other forms of content, there is no solid guarantee. I just feel like, okay, maybe my audience would need this. But at least with those question um, approaches, I know that I know one person is going to need it. So I don't have a fixed way. I select what to write in the moment. I think sometimes also it's based on what I am focusing on. Like, for example, recently I started a series on my YouTube channel, which is JavaScript interview questions. So whenever I get questions from people, now I just group it as different parts in that series. So sometimes it's also depending on what um, what am I focusing on at the moment? Okay, I'm focusing on JavaScript interview questions. But aside that, it's just, it's just different factors at different moments. Sometimes also, do you say emotional or just something I feel like, oh, I like this better. I want to make a video version of this. And that's it. N nice. And when you're doing some of this, do you, how, do you have a thick, fixed schedule or are you kind of just... I have an idea, I'm going to write it today, or I'm going to go for a few weeks without writing anything because I'm doing other things. How, what does your routine look like? Well, um, the last four months when I didn't have a full-time job, uh, I think on some days I'm very inspired. And um, do you say inspired? Or I, I just feel so good about content creation. Maybe the previous day I got this very nice comment on one of my video and I'm like, Oh, now I have to create more videos. So sometimes I'm just so encouraged and I, in a day I could, uh, I could make videos like every day for maybe two or three consecutive days on my YouTube channel. Or it could be an article. I could write it. And on some other days, maybe because I'm trying to avoid being burnt out and I want to have some rest for myself. And then I just, I just, it could just be one day off or two day off and I come back the next day. And also because I'm focusing on multiple platforms at once, it has been a bit difficult to manage like on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, and also writing articles. It's sometimes it's just so much to manage. So on some days, I'm just like, okay, today I'm going to prioritize TikTok over YouTube. On some other days, I'm like, I'm going to prioritize my article over the rest of them. But uh, I don't have a fixed um, routine. Before, I tried to do things every day, but I was gradually approaching burnout. So I just took it like whatever I feel inspired to do in a day, and inspiration can come from different ways. Like I mentioned before, comment could also be like, I wake up on the right side of bed, or it could just be that um, I'm just having a good day and I feel like creating content. So I don't have anything fixed. It's just, it's also different factors. And I think you would have also noticed that this is just a team with me. Most of the things, most of the personal things I do, there is no exact routine. I think also because I get bored of routines sometimes. So it's usually flexible and what I feel inspired to do in the moment I do it. When you create those videos, like say back to back over a period of three days, do you just post them once you create it or do you time it so that I'm going to wait a certain number of days? Because a lot of studies from various people always say that these are the times you want to post on social media. These are the times you want to post articles on these networks. Do you follow some of those things or are you just more of a, I created it, it's good, I'm going to send it out, people will find it. Yeah, I'm the second person. I, I I mean, I've heard about this a lot, posting specific times, giving specific durations and all that. But I think for me, it's, I don't want to be held down by all these things. Yes, I love when the numbers are adding up, when the views are increasing. I love all of that. But for me, I don't want to focus on all those things and then use that to delay myself. I mean, I make a wonderful video and then I have to wait three or four days before people can see the video. And maybe if somebody asks a question, I can, I would say, oh, I've already made a video about this. Just wait for four days. What if it's urgent? What if it's something they immediately want to know? So I think as much as I love when the numbers are adding up and increasing, of course, it's really nice to see such growth, but I don't love being held down by that. So if I have a video idea, I record it. And once I'm done, 
um, um, editing and every other thing, I publish it. And sometimes when I do two videos in a day, then I post the other video the next day. But now that I have a full time job, I think it's also it's something where I would have to start scheduling my contents, like my videos. Maybe on the weekend I make two or three and then I could just space them out during the week. One comes out on Monday, another one on Tuesday, the other one on Friday. But yeah, but before my full time job, it wasn't something that I prioritize. I was just sharing as I make them. Yeah. No, that, that's exactly my process as well. You know, the way I look at it is that once you create content over a period of time, the long tail of content will eventually add up and people will go to yes. Google, they'll search it, they'll find it. It's unless you're anything as timely as if you're leaving like, you know, a live tweeting of like a conference that's going on or something like that. At least in my case, most of the content, I try to create it so that it's relevant for at least a few years so that people will be yes. able to use it. And for me, I see all the metrics. I agree. It's nice to see the metrics going up and so on. But the immediate satisfaction of helping somebody who's, which is exactly. also a motivator for that content I'm creating for is because someone asked the question, I'm like, I could explain this or I could record a video and make it much more easy to understand. Yeah. And having that person benefit from it. Yes, I, you know, most of my videos are often posted like on a Thursday evening or a Friday evening or on a weekend, which is like the worst yeah. time to post anything. Like people say like, post it so that Monday morning at 8 a.m. when someone is like sitting at work, drinking a coffee, they're gonna be reading this. That's when you wanna really get to it. I'm like, no, no, I'm not I'm not doing that. You know, exactly. maybe I would, but I, I think just like you, I have a full-time job. There's not, content creation is not the thing that I'm optimizing for. It's not like Mr. Beast, whose entire career and life is around creating great content, we're optimizing thumbnails, optimizing everything is like yeah. critical for maintaining like his success. In this case, I'm like, I'm helping people. You seem to be in a similar mindset of we're helping people. So it's okay. Just get all yeah. this stuff out when it is ready. No, that that's relevant in so yeah. many ways. I think for me also, I don't, I don't really focus on the immediate traction. I just, I put it out there and I know, and one thing I also do with my videos is I do well to make references. So if I mention something I know I've made a video about it, I could just give a summary of that in the video and I'd be like, if you want to watch more, I've done a video about this before. So I don't really focus on the immediate traction. What I just know, just the way you said it is, if a video doesn't have value today, it may have value next year. Like there are some of my videos where I create them and in one month you see very low views and then all of a sudden it just gets like, some number of views a couple of months later so that's why i'm not focused on all those things because just the way you put it eventually they would add up and come together so i why should i be held back by that now yeah no i, I hear you I'm, I'm sure people who are watching are probably like you guys are just doing it wrong here i'm like that's okay it's cool <laughs> <laughs> it's all good this is, this is not advice on how to build like you know like a like a very viral kind of a video mm. that goes like you know Take the algorithms, knowledge, in, you know, all of that internally, and makes the best thing out of it. You know, so I think that's a that, that's a caveat. You know, I'll put out there in terms of it. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you use Notion to take notes on ideas and topics that you have. My, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a guess here and tell me if I'm right or wrong here. Your your items in your Notion are so large, there's probably no way in a lifetime you'll be able to get through all of them. Is that a fair way of summarizing it? Or are you actually very meticulous about having a good input output on it? Uh, well, the, the thing is I'm not done. So, I mean, I could get some ideas from this video and I'll go back to my notion and I put it there. But if I don't add anything on my notion from today, then I could finish the things on there in the next, say, four, five months. But in reality, I'm still going to keep adding. So there is no way. I don't think I'm ever going to finish the ideas on my notion. I think that also helps because whenever I want to create an, a topic or a video and I don't know what to create, I can just go there. I don't have to think, what do people really need right now at the moment? I could just go there and pick something. But I don't think I'm ever going to finish that list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that that's a consistent theme I've seen with all content creators is that you enjoy the art of content creation. There's some who create content purely because it's their job or they have a fixed schedule they work with, which in case they have exactly A, B, and C to talk about, especially if they're creating content on something they're not really passionate about. Whereas in this case, it seems like you're really passionate about the topics that you are creating content for. Do you ever just like wake up in the middle of the night going like, this would be a good topic to write about. Let me just like, you know, barely open my eyes, go to Notion, 
put some ideas and then I forget about it in the morning. Do you do the same thing? Yeah, true. That means sometimes I'm on the bed and maybe I'm I I can't find some sleep immediately and then something just ah oh, wait. If I have an article on this, that would be nice. And then I just pick my laptop on the bed and I just make some rough notes. Sometimes I could even finish it right there. Some other times it could just be rough notes that I come back to the following day. Yeah. Do you also have the same, you know, problem that I have? We might be watching a TV show or at a movie theater watching a movie. And you're like, that's something that we totally write about in a simplified way in JavaScript or CSS. You like take your phone up, make sure no one is seeing it very, throw the brightness all the way down and it's like write notes down. Do you also do that as well? I mean, I may not turn the brightness down, but I, I do things like that a lot. <laughs> When I come across things on Twitter, movie, sometimes I'm just walking on the road and for some reasons, I just think about JavaScript and I'm like, hmm, this could be a good article or a good video. And I quickly pick my phone. Good thing Notion is accessible on different platforms. Yeah. Pick my phone and I just write it there and I put my phone back and I just continue with my day. <laughs> yeah, no, that is, that is great to hear, you know, because... It, you know, you're one among a lot of content creators who share that similar view. Because when I first started out with this, content creators aren't really a big network. It's not like you go around being like, hey, you're a content creator. Let me know like how your day-to-day -day goes and so on. So when I first started doing this, I'm like, am I the only one doing this? Is this normal? And you're like that. Yeah. But over the period of time, you know, with democratization of social media and so on, you're like, okay, this is actually a very common thing. And it's great to see that people who are doing this also didn't have much better content as well. They're passionate about what they create mm -hmm. and do all this work. So you mentioned you post on multiple platforms. How difficult is it to take an idea, let's say create a video, to go from like, okay, I have a video for YouTube. Do you re-record it again for TikTok or do you kind of record it once and you know, with a style like me, like I can kind of squish everything down vertically to make it work on the TikTok form factor? What is your process like for making this work on all of these various, at least it's about video specifically for now, like all yeah. these video files? Uh, well, um, this is one pattern that I use for some of my content, not all of them. So usually the first point is Instagram. This is for some of them, not all my content. I have an Instagram version of this. So I already have the, 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 the pictures with the notes. Then I can record a YouTube version. And for that YouTube version now, you know, from the Instagram one I've made, I've also gotten feedback from some people, some things that weren't very clear for them, or maybe some corrections. Like recently, I actually got a correction where somebody was like, no, actually, this is wrong. I had to also make a follow-up post so, to say, thanks for the correction. This was actually wrong. So posting on Instagram helps me. And then on my YouTube, I use the notes from Instagram, the things I've written already, and then I can expand on them for YouTube. Also from Instagram, I turn the pictures to PDFs and I post on LinkedIn. Uh, I also noticed that with LinkedIn, when you post many images, people would love to swipe through the pictures as PDFs than, you know, going through them as images. So I also transform them to PDFs and have them on LinkedIn. Then I have the YouTube version. And for the TikTok version, I'm still trying to think of a way that I can, um, do my YouTubes in such a way that it will be easily transformable to TikTok. But at the moment, I have to usually record them again. And I think that's also what makes it really hard for me to be consistent with code content on TikTok because it's like, I've said all these things again. And I'm going to like, and even getting the YouTube version, right? I probably had to say it like three or four times. And now I have mm -hmm. to go through that again just to get it right for TikTok. But what I'm thinking of doing, I haven't really planned myself well, but I'm thinking of recording my screen in such a way that um, for the YouTube version, I can just zoom in in my editor so that people can see the stuff well because I'm trying to capture everything. And then for the yeah. TikTok version, I can just get the resolution that will be okay for TikTok that would still capture the necessary things. So I'm thinking to take that approach so that I could be more encouraged in sharing code content on TikTok. But yeah, it usually starts from Instagram to LinkedIn to YouTube. Even for my articles, I would make use of what I already have on Instagram. But then TikTok, I have to usually record again. Have you looked into YouTube shorts? Because I see a lot of notifications and ads to upload to YouTube shorts. And I, I don't do much TikTok. I did one video just last week just to get the idea of like the mechanics of 
what the form factor should look like and everything understood. Is that something you're looking into as well? Yeah, when I do YouTube shorts, because it's the same resolution, I post that on TikTok. I don't have to make a, a, a yeah. second version. So I try to maximize YouTube shorts sometimes, but the challenge is that there is just so much you can do in one minute. So sometimes I have to think about it. Do I make a YouTube short? And because I know that has more potential of gaining traction because of the whole algorithm or whatever, then maybe I make a full version. And at the end of the short version, I say, watch the full version here. Or do I just try to make the short version short and concise enough? So sometimes I have those conversations, but I think what I resolve to is maybe for content, I feel I can cover enough in one minute without having to tell people go here to watch more. I try to do that on shorts. But if I cannot, if, if there's so much information that would not be enough for one minute, then I make a complete video. But whatever I make for short, I take it directly to TikTok. I don't have to do much, much. Uh, I don't have to re-record it again, basically. Nice. Content reuse is like the greatest gift. If we can somehow pull it off and it looks high quality. And so yeah. On. I mean, one thing I also learned was users generally don't like being directed to another platform to learn something. You, you make something on Twitter and you're like, of course, with Twitter, it's almost because you have to create threads and you have to write. So in some cases, there are exceptions. But I learned that, for example, on YouTube, whenever I tell people to read PDFs on YouTube, on, on LinkedIn, sorry, I get more traction than when I tell them, okay, I made this video about this topic, go to YouTube from LinkedIn. Only the very interested ones would go there. So that's why I really maximize the whole content reuse thing. Like for the audience I'm growing on LinkedIn, I try to give them their own version. In cases where I cannot, I tell them, okay, you have to go to YouTube for this one. But I'll try my best to give them their version. On TikTok, I try, them, try to give them their version. And in cases where I cannot, then I have to redirect them to another platform. So that's why I actually reuse content a lot. And also, I think the algorithms also detect when you're trying to send people away from their platform and also do their own shady things to, well, yeah, I, I, I will say it is shady things to make it so that your content isn't visible at all. It's possible. It's possible. <laughs> it's but I think another thing I, I do too is, for example, for my videos, I try to create teasers. So instead of just telling people leave this platform and go to YouTube, I try to show them like a short video just to let them know, um, just to let them know it would be worth going to YouTube. So I think doing that in a few cases on LinkedIn was actually better than just putting the link and saying, go here. But then that short teaser that says, okay, this is what I'm explaining in this video. I already have people's attention on LinkedIn. And now at least few of them will be like, okay, now I want to learn more about this. Then they click the link. Nice. That's a great way of being able to kind of get people interested and also be, you upload a video, which gives you an extra signal in all these mm -hmm. platforms. And this is the content you need to get in front of people's yeah. eyeballs, which is always, it was always a big challenge as, as you find out over a period of time. You mentioned earlier, you started off on dev.to. And then you started moving to your own platform. Walk me through that. What made you decide to go from a platform that is part of a larger community to going off and having your own brand? Um, I, I think just because I wanted to have my own website, like also because of the people that I was, um, you know, watching during the time, seeing how they were doing in the technical writing space, I noticed they have their own website. So for me, I feel like to be fancy to have a dillionmikita.com than dev.to slash Dillion McGee that that's somebody else's platform. So that was why I had created my own platform. But I will be honest, I actually struggled at some point because I was like, I don't have so much audience on my platform. So even when I post articles here, yes, they may have value years from now. But when I post on dev.to, my content has more potential of reaching out to the existing audience. When I post yeah. on my platform, yeah, then I have to really do um, some content promotion myself, probably on my WhatsApp status, my Instagram, my Twitter, like, hey, I just published a new article. So I struggle with that. And I think what I resolved to doing was I post more on these platforms than I post on my own platform. And then usually I would have some links that, you know, if you want to learn more about this or if there is a reference to a different article, 
that different article will be on my platform. Then I post the main article on their platform. So hopefully I get some traction um, through that. But yeah, I mean, I know that the more consistent that I am with posting on my platform, it would grow at some point. But I think also because I don't have that patience and I want to reach as much audience um, as I can with my articles, that's why I do that. But I think with videos, I'm not, I don't know, there's just this assurance that comes with videos like, oh, I know you're going to have value tomorrow. I can be patient. I can wait. But with articles, it's like I want to maximize um, platforms with audiences already, established audiences, if I say. And I think articles are a much more crowded space. I think a lot more people just write articles versus the number of people creating videos is large, but it's not quite as large, especially if you create high quality content. And so I think it's a luxury also having like, yeah, I'm going to post the video. I'd be more confident that people will view it because there isn't too many things out there like it. Whereas for articles, there are way too many things. You have to go to Google everybody, and search for the right keywords general. and make yeah. sure you're ranking higher in the keywords and make sure it's linked appropriately and, yeah. and all of those things. But just that's a lot of unknown variables as a part of it. Yeah, true. So let's switch to the technical side a little bit. So what tools do you use for recording video? Like what's your software choice? What kind of webcam do you use? What's your microphone? Um, so for my microphone, this one, I have the Shure MV7X. So there is a Shure MV7 and there's the MV7X. The MV7 has a USB that allows me to record. I could plug the USB directly to my laptop and record, but that is more expensive. But with the Shure MV7 is it has the XLR, which means I also need to get like an amplifier that receives the XLR and then it goes to my laptop. And I mean, when you combine the amplifier and the X and the X and the Shure MV7 X, it's almost the same price as the Shure MV7. But I think the reason why I love this separation was I also thought about other things I could use the amplifier for. And then that was why I got it. So that's the microphone for my camera. I have a Canon DC, uh, I've forgotten exactly the version, but I have a camera, but I usually enjoy using my iPhone 13 Pro, my phone, to record my videos because it's usually sharper in quality. And sometimes it makes me sad because I got this camera so I could use my phone less, but my phone is still giving more value than the camera. So I, I think for recently I've been using my phone's camera so i record the visual the video itself with my phone record the micro the sound with my microphone then on my final cord pro which is the editor i use for my videos i bring the audio and the video together i combine them i sync them final cord pro has this amazing feature where you can just sync both clips together and you would specify that the sound from the microphone should be the sound then the visuals from the camera should be the visuals so they come together to make the video and i also have some um, key lights i mean i have this soft i have this soft box i have this godox um light and this this soft box that i also got recently and i think that also improved my um I actually got it because there was so much light spilling on my background from the previous key light that i had and i mm -hmm. wanted some darkness in my background and more of the light focused on myself. So that was why I got this. And um, yeah, I think that is pretty much it. I used to have a ring light, a standing ring light before, but now I just use the phone holder on the ring light to hold my phone because I don't have a phone. I don't have a different phone holder. And I have a MacBook Pro. So I think that is, and I got the, this colorful things here that Oh, nice. Just, the Philips Hue, the Philips Hue lights, correct? Yeah, that just yeah. do some stuff on my back. I still feel like I haven't really hacked this background practical light thing, but I mean, this is what I just use at the moment for some little flavor at the back. Nice. You know, a lot of your setup is very similar too. I started with the Philips Hue lights as well. So I have those little bars in the back and then, you know, on my phone, I occasionally just change the colors to make it look different. You can actually animate them as well, as it turns out. So while you're recording, you actually have it animate and do all of these things which is pretty neat in its own way. What do you so, use you now? So right now I have the Philips Hue lights. I have a white wall that's actually reflecting off of. So it's like right just behind my monitor. I have a Blue Yeti microphone, mostly for the USB you know, reasons behind it. For the webcam, I've been actually using my iPhone. Well, ever since I never got into the whole Elgato cam link where I'm physically tethering my mm -hmm. iPhone to my laptop, 
But with the whole continuity camera they introduced as part of the new Mac OS version, it's trivial. I just put my iPhone up on the stand. The, I go to any video app under the camera. It just says, you're going to connect to your iPhone. I'm like, sure. And it works really well. So I, I switched between that. that and the Opal C1, which is the pre-release phone uh, camera that's been okay. getting a lot of popularity as well as like it's built by, I think, some ex-phone developed phone designers. So it uses a, a phone sensor. So it gives you better quality than a traditional webcam. But I think the iPhone so far has been like my favorite go-to because yeah. the quality is so nice. They, you know, it's nice and nicely integrated. So you can actually click on the, on the I'm in spotlight mode right now, just like it would be in like spotlight when you're taking a video of somebody. So that gives you highlights and all these things on the phone itself, yeah. which means that maybe this lighting isn't even necessary. The phone can take care of all these things for me. Yeah. I always go back to, I mean, it's sad because I feel like I'm also, you know, in a way using the battery and the battery may um, lose its strength with time. Boy, I just go back to it. Just yeah, the, the solution for that quality. is this. See, I have a USB lightning cable like right here. I just yeah. actually plug it into my phone and it charges it while it's recording. Ah, that doesn't affect it in any way. I should try that. Yeah, no, it's a. Uh, it's surprising that it's you know one would assume that during the pandemic when it was like working from home that a lot of great innovation would come in terms of like webcams and audio mm. setups and things like that that anybody can just with no fuss just be able to have a great quality setup. It's mm-hmm. ironic that what ended up becoming, I think in my view, the best solution is our phones. In our this phones. case, iPhone's integration with the Mac OS, which always had the capability. So why did it take so long for it to be able to do all of this? Yeah, true, true. So, no, that's really cool. Well, I think we covered a lot of ground here in a lot of these areas. Is there anything else you'd like to touch upon or you think that people would be benefiting from learning from you on? Um, the one thing that comes to mind, just as we mentioned in our conversation is how content creation or just wanting to teach somebody something also helps you learn that thing, or at least improve your knowledge in that thing. I mean, I've had few times where I was going to teach this thing in React. This is the topic. I already have an idea. I just wanted to put that idea down. And because I was making some research, then I realized that I only knew this thing 70% 70% of it. There was still 30% of it that I didn't know. And just because I wanted to teach somebody or probably because I was already writing it. And then I had some questions like, wait, this thing has always been like this. Why exactly is that the case? And then I make some research and I'm like, ah, so that is why now I have more context that I can put in my article for the end reader. But as much as the end reader is getting so much value from my research and everything, I started this article with just 70%. Now I'm done with the article. I have 90% of that thing. So this is something that I usually tell people. Like there are different ways you can improve your knowledge in tech. You can do it by watching tutorials, by practicing. You can also do it by teaching others. And I also tell people that, you know, people think, okay, you need to know this thing 100% before you write about it. Like only the professionals should come and share their knowledge and stuff like this. But then I've also just the way it has happened for me. I let people know it's a journey. And I mean, for videos, it's hard to come back and edit the video, but with an article, all you have to do is just go back and be like, if you even want to add, you could add something like this is an edit from five years later. This is the way it's done now. Or if you don't even want to add that information, you just update it. You can always come back to update things. So for videos, not everybody may have the, not everybody may want to be on screen. Not everybody may be able to talk as they could. But I think for articles, I feel like it's easier for most people to jump into that. So if there's anybody watching who would love to create content or love to understand why they should even create content in the first place, there are so many ways that it could improve your knowledge and in some ways, you also build some form of recognition. I mean, if not for the recognition that I was able to build, I probably wouldn't have met you and start collaborating on articles or even be on this video today. And I'm not saying like those who don't create content or who don't write articles are not doing the right thing, but I'm just saying this is one way that amongst other ways that you can grow in your career, improve your knowledge, share value to others, and also be recognized. 
for what you do. So regardless of whatever point you're starting, maybe you're still a beginner, maybe you're already mid, whatever, you can just share your learnings. When I started, it was just more of, this is what I learned today. I didn't come to say something like, oh, I know this perfectly well, this is how to do this. But I just came, uh, my approach was, oh, I just learned this new thing in CSS today. This is how to do this, this is how to do that. Few people may feel like, oh, I already knew that. Some people may be like, oh, so that's possible in CSS. And that even up to now, most of the things I share, are, oh, I just learned this new thing. I just learned this new thing. So if anybody is scared of trying to come off as, I know this more than every other person, can just change your approach to this is what I learned. And then with time, you build confidence. And then with time, you can be begin be, you can begin to say things like, oh, this is how to do it. That is how to do it without being scared that you may be wrong. So, yeah, for anybody interested, it's content creation or article writing is really a nice way to grow in your career. So I recommend it for any and for everyone. That's probably the best conclusion to this episode. I think we can ever come up with any. So thank you so much for taking time and sharing a lot of your knowledge about how you create content and keep doing all the great work you've been doing. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for having me on this, this platform. Nice having a conversation and seeing you face to face or virtually. Likewise. <laughs> Talking a bit. <laughs>